God's divinely inspired word. And I'm going to hide God's word in my heart that I might not sin against him. Amen. Take your Bibles and open to the book of James, chapter 4. We're going to pick up our series where we left off. On Sunday mornings, we were going through the book of James, and we're going to finish this. And we're going to deal this morning with James chapter 4, verses 13 down to verse 17. And I titled this sermon this morning, If the Lord Wills. If the Lord Wills. We are in a brand new year. Many of you have already planned out your whole calendar year. 2017. Nothing wrong with planning. Planning is a part of life. Some people here, you have your appointment books and you've got all your appointments lined up and that's okay. Fathers plan on how to provide for their families financially. High school graduates plan on where they're going to go to school and college and what they're going to do after that, pursue a job. We plan vacations, family activities. Pastors plan ministries nothing wrong with planning. In fact, did you know scripture encourages good planning? Write down Proverbs 27, 12, a prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself, the simple pass on and are punished. So it's good to try to foresee some things that might happen and to prepare for those things. If you turn into the scripture and read about the apostle Paul, you'll find that he was constantly planning, planning missionary trips in Romans 15, 24, Paul planned to visit the believers in Rome on his way to Spain. And even God plans. Job 42, verse 2, no plan of yours, God, can be thwarted. Planning is good. Someone said, he who fails to plan, plans to fail. Another person said, plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Now, there's a certain, however, kind of planning that is condemned in scripture. It's not good. And we could call it presumptuous planning. And that's what James is describing here in these verses of chapter 4, verses 13, down to verse 17. There are plans that are dishonoring to God. There are plans that are done in a sinful manner. It's a foolish planning, and it doesn't include God in it. And this is exactly what James is attacking here. He saw a lot of this going on in his day. It's the attitude that says, this is my life. I'll do what I want. I'll do what I please, irregardless of the Lord. And we don't want to make some of the same mistakes that this man made here in this passage about planning. So I want you to see three mistakes that are made when people plan for the future. And these are sins in the sight of God. So if you're taking notes, write down, first of all, there's an attitude we should never take. An attitude we should never take. Look again at verse 13. Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. There's an attitude here that James condemns. What is the attitude? It's an attitude of self-sufficiency. It's an attitude that says, I can get along without God. And what he's describing here is a first century businessman He's kind of a wheeler dealer. He's very astute in his plans. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He knew exactly how he was going to get there. At least he thought he did. But he was planning as if there was no God. And this man has an arrogant attitude. He has a self-sufficient attitude. The attitude that says, I don't need God's help. And so James introduces this with the phrase, notice again in verse 13, go to now. This is a way of expressing negative uh, 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 disapproval. Uh, that's the way it's used here in the Greek. We would say it like this. Now, now listen to me, you. Listen to me, what I'm going to say. You that are planning without praying, without God. Here's this man. And first of all, notice he plans the period. He says in verse 13, today or tomorrow. The Greek literally says where it says who say, the ones who are saying. The Greek verb lego means to say something based on reason and logic. And so he is, he's reasoned it all out. He's used his logic. And he's saying, you know, this is what I'm going to do. This is pure logic to him. This is the right thing to do. And again, there's nothing wrong with logic, nothing wrong with reason. But that's all he's using. He's got it in his schedule. He's planned out his year. He's counted out 365 days. It all seems reasonable to him, logical. He plans the period. He plans the place. He says in verse 13, we'll go into 
This city, such a city, this was an age of founding cities when there was opportunity to start businesses. So he spreads out his map. He looks at all the trends in business. He says, here's a place that's growing. Here's a place where I can go and I can make uh, a good business. And so he plans the procedure in verse 13. Today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. He knew exactly what he was going to do. He's a merchant. He studied all the Wall Street charts in Fortune 500. He's quite confident that he's going to be able to make money where it says buy and sell is one word in the Greek. It's where we get our word emporium. He wants to build a large, successful business. And he thinks that if he's there for a certain amount of time, he could do it, no problem. And he, he plans to profit. He says buy and sell and get gain. So we see, we see the man, he plans the location, the vocation, and the duration. Now we see the motivation. What's he after? He's after money. This man wants to make money. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with making money. You can't have a good business unless you do make money. But if your whole sole goal in life is to get rich, that's a wrong motive, friend. The Bible says don't set your heart upon riches. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. If your eye be evil, your whole body is full of darkness. Someone says, well, yeah, money talks. That's right. It says goodbye. Amen. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now, again, there's nothing wrong intrinsically in what he's doing here. He's planning. He's planning ahead. He's planning where to live. Everyone has to live somewhere. It's okay to plan all those things. Nothing wrong with making a profit. That's all good. You say, what's the problem? The problem is he's doing it all without God. He's forgotten God in this whole procedure. Look at verse 16. But now you rejoice in your boastings. And all such rejoicing is evil. Here's a man who's planned out everything, but he's done it in a spirit of self-sufficiency and pride. He's boasting about what he's going to do all by himself. He's self-sufficient. He's arrogant. It reminds me of that poem, Invictus. I won't quote the whole thing to you, but there's one line in that poem. Invictus is a Latin means victorious. It's, here's a man who's conquering life, and there's a last expression in that poem that says, For I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That spirit of arrogance. Whenever I read that, I want to say, Captain, your boat is about to sink. This is the attitude that James is condemning here. You ever feel like you're the captain of your own soul? Every once in a while, I'll talk to students that have their whole life planned out. And they haven't really prayed about it. They haven't really talked to God about it. And so, as Christians, we must make our plans centered around God. That's what's missing here. We have to ask the question, what's going to bring God the most glory? That should be the central thing. And this man is living basically like a practical atheist. He's not even thinking about there being a God. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm the, I'm the master of my fate. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I've got it all planned out. There are a lot of people living like that in our world today. And they've got all their plans, but they've left God out. This is an arrogant attitude. So there's an attitude we should never take. But I want you to write down point number two. There is an assumption we should never make. Look at verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. You say, what's the assumption that he's making? He's assuming that he's guaranteed tomorrow. He's assuming that everything's going to work out just as he plans it. Many people assume that. They make their plans, they got it all figured out. They assume that everything's going to go just exactly the way they want it to go. They assume that the future is certain and that they have this sense of entitlement about how things should turn out, about how things are supposed to be. And you know what they find out? It doesn't happen that way. You know, I've met many people that have shattered dreams. Things didn't turn out the way they planned. And so they lived depressed. They lived in bitterness to God. 
because things didn't happen the way they planned them. I even meet sometimes ministers who are angry and frustrated over things that have happened in their life and in their ministry, the plans that they had made, and it just didn't work out that way. God didn't call them to do the thing that they thought they were called to do. That reminds me of the story of Jonah. Remember Jonah? He didn't want to go to Nineveh. God said, go to Nineveh. And Jonah got on a boat and went to Tarshish. And what did God do? God put him on a submarine back to Nineveh. He didn't want to be the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Nineveh. He wanted to be the pastor of the Temple Baptist Church of Tarshish. And God says, no, that's not what I want. And so what do we find about Jonah? He's bitter. At the end of the book of Jonah, he's angry against the Lord because things are not turning out the way he wanted them to turn out. There's some things that this man here in this story fails to comprehend. First of all, he fails to comprehend the complexities of life. Look again at verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. Things are not as simple as we think they should be. It doesn't, you know, life is not a fairy tale that turns out and they live happily ever after. How many of you know that? That's not the way life is. We have our dreams dashed at times. Some people may count on things happening. They don't happen. We think we know what the future is going to hold, but we don't. Over 40 years ago, futurists peered into their crystal balls, and they predicted that one of the biggest problems for the coming generation was going to be what will they do with all their spare time. A Senate subcommittee claimed, this is many years ago, that by 1985, people would be working just 22 hours a week or 27 weeks a year, and people could retire at age 38. Anybody here retired at 38? <laughs> Anybody here just working 22 hours a week? Best laid plans. There's no way to comprehend the complexities of life. Life is not that simple. It's a complex matrix of forces and events and contingencies and circumstances, many of which we have no control over. And so we don't know the future. Again, in verse 14, he says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. James says, you don't know what's going to be on the morrow. The Bible says, boast not thyself for tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. We don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. I'll never forget, years ago, one morning I got up and turned on the television. There was a a young girl there on the television uh, that was putting up a picture of her mother, and she said, if anybody sees her, please let us know. What had happened that day was that her mother went to work in Oklahoma City in the federal building there. And some of you remember that event. A madman parked a truck in front of the building, and it blew up. That woman that was lost, she was a member of the church I had pastored. I knew her very well. She got up that morning. She went into work. She had no idea what the day held. And that bomb blew up and many died. They found her body eight days later after digging out through the rubble. She had no idea. We don't know what the day is going to bring. Amen. Sometimes I'll be driving here to church and I'll turn on the radio and I'll hear the news about the traffic and I'll hear something like this. Don't go down 95 South. There was a traffic accident. There was a fatal car accident. And you know the first thing I'll think? Here was a man or a woman that got up that morning, got ready to go to work, probably rushed out of the house without kissing his wife and hugging his children, off to work. He had no idea that he only had a few minutes to live, and that was it. We don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. There are some people here in this congregation, and there was an event last year and, I, and I'm not talking about anybody specifically, but I'm just imagining in a crowd this big, there are probably some people here, you had something that happened in your life that changed your life, and you didn't see it coming. It could have been something good or something bad, or just an event that happened that you could not predict. Friend, we don't know the future, and don't let people tell you they can predict the future, things like election results. I don't care how many polls you take. Some of you are old enough to remember 
the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Going to Return in 1988. <laughs> Some of you remember that guy wrote a book that said Jesus is going to come in 1988. And, and, and the Trinity Broadcasting Network developed their whole television show around that one event. And people flew to the Holy Land so that they could be in the Holy Land when Jesus came back. By the way, I have that book. If you want it, I can give it to you for free. <laughs> didn't happen. It didn't seem to matter that Jesus said, that day and that hour knoweth no man. Right. We don't know the future. This man, he failed to comprehend the complexities of life. He failed to comprehend the uncertainty of life. But also he failed to comprehend the brevity of life. Notice what he says again. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. James says life is like a brittle thread. Life is like steam from a tea kettle. Life is like a puff of smoke. Life is like breath on a frosty morning. And as you sit here today, there is but a heartbeat between you and eternity, and someone has described that heartbeat as a muffled drum beating a funeral march to the grave. Someone else has also said that life is so short that the wood of the cradle rubs tightly against the marble of the tomb. So no wonder Moses said, Lord, teach us to number our days, that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. We just don't know what's going to happen. James says life is, is like a, th a vapor. It appears just for a little time, and then it vanishes away. I read a, a thought-provoking article years ago. It, it said, if you're 35, you have 500 days to live. And the whole thesis of the article was this. If you subtract the time spent sleeping and working and tending to personal matters and hygiene and, and all these other little things, uh, and you, in the next 36 years, you have equivalent, the equivalent of only 500 uh, hour, or 500 days rather to spend how you would wish. Kind of a sobering article. Reminds you how brief our time here really is. It passes by so quickly. When as a child, I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth, I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. And when older still I grew, time flew. And soon I shall find in passing on, time gone. Ladies and gentlemen, I am now a grandfather. <laughs> that still has not sunk in. Where did the time go? Job said, or the Bible says, our days are on earth are as a shadow. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Remember that my life is but a breath, Job 7.7. 7. In Psalm 102, the psalmist said, for my days are consumed like smoke. That's why Richard Baxter, the great Puritan preacher, said, we're to preach as though never to preach again, and as a dying man to dying men. Because that's exactly our situation. Don't assume that we have tomorrow. Whatever you want to do, do it today. Yeah. Say I love you to your family today. Hug your children today. Don't assume that you have tomorrow. There's an attitude we should never take, and that is we can do what we want to do without God. There's an assumption we should never make, and that is to assume that all the plans that we make are going to go just the way we want them to go, and that tomorrow is guaranteed to us. We are entitled to tomorrow. That's an assumption we should never make. Then number three, here's the third mistake. There's an acknowledgement we should never forsake. And James teaches us here that we're to make our plans, but those plans must be made in acknowledgement of and in submission to the absolute sovereignty of Almighty God, the one who's in control. Look again in verse number 15. For ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. He's teaching us to submit to the sovereignty of God who is over all. You can propose one thing, but God is the one who's in charge. He can overrule that plan. He can do something else. And God has done that many times throughout history. Some of the most grand plans of so-called mighty men have been overruled by God because God is the one who's in charge Little Napoleons out there that say, my will be done. God can overrule that. God does whatever he wants to do. And that's why James says, look, we ought to say, if the Lord wills, I'm going to do this. 
or I'm going to do that. We have to live our whole life in submission to the sovereignty of God. That's what he's telling us here. And by the way, if you read through the New Testament, you'll find that this is the attitude of the Apostle Paul. You see that all the time. In in Acts chapter 18, verse 21, he told the Jews of Ephesus that he's going to return and he's going to renew a ministry among them if the Lord wills. He said, if God wills, I'll do this. In 1 Corinthians 4, 19, he said that he would make another visit to Corinth if the Lord wills wills and that he would remain with them for a considerable amount of time if the Lord wills. Paul uses this expression throughout the New Testament and James is telling us this is what and by the way this is not just a a cliche this is a an attitude of dependence upon God humble submission to God in our life to whatever the Lord wants and James is telling the Christians here this is to be our attitude of life. It's okay to make your plans. Go ahead, plan well. But you better say if the Lord wills. You better say, Lord, if this is what you want, I'll do it. Because I'm going to live my life in total submission to your plan, whatever you want. And that way, if things don't turn out the way I think they should, I won't get bitter, I won't get disappointed. I will submit to the sovereign will of God and say this is what the Lord wills. And so if the Lord wills, I'm going to do this. And by the way, this was the way many Christians lived centuries ago. And if you read history books and you read the lives of Christians, sometimes they'll have letters written from one Christian to another, and you'll notice that at the end of the letter, they'll have two little letters there, D period, V period. You say, what does that stand for? That stands for the Latin Dio Volente, which means Lord willing. Lord willing. And they wrote that there. Not as a meaningless expression, but a heartfelt submission to God. In other words, I'll do this if the Lord wills. A.B. Simpson once said this, I like to interpose in all of my appointments if the Lord wills. Now, why do we do that? Because we recognize that God is sovereign over all of our life. Everything. You say, what does it mean that God's sovereign? It means he's in absolute control. It means that there's no detail that's not under his control. He controls everything. Now, again, by the way, I I believe in planning well. I believe in, you know, having a life insurance policy in case I should die, that my family would be taken care of. That's all good. That's good planning. But when we make all of our plans, we say, okay, Lord, my life is in your hands. Do what you will. And go ahead and save and invest. But understand this. The only real financial security is in God. Our economy could crash tomorrow. Things could happen. Our our retirement investments could crumble. The only real security that you have, that I have, is faith and trust in a gracious God. That's the only security that we have. When I was flying in here to the States, something happened to me that never happened before. We were landing at JFK, and we came in for a landing... And as soon as the plane touched down, he, he gunned the engines and he took off again. And then kind of flew around. Talk about an adrenaline rush. <laughs> I'm thinking, what in the world? People were scared. And finally he came over and he said, look, we were landing a plane and we found out there was still another jet on the runway. Saw it at the last second, had to take off. You know, talk about, you know, not knowing what's going to happen. But the Lord is in control, isn't he? And trusting God as our only source of security. Because God is exhaustively sovereign. Did you know there's nothing that happens in your life by chance? God has total control. The very hairs of your head are numbered. A a bird can't fall to the ground unless it be by the will of God. And and James uh, and the Jews that he wrote to understood this. This was taught throughout the Old Testament. He's in control over creation. The Bible says fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. 
He's over control of animals. The Bible makes that very clear. He's, over, he's in control of seemingly random or chance events. The Bible says the lot is cast into the lap of the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. The lot was two stones. You could just throw those stones, and that's how they would determine the will of God in the Old Testament. You can go ahead and throw the stones, but how they landed was the way God determined they would land. The whole disposing, the whole revealing of what he wanted was of the Lord, the Bible says. He's sovereign over the affairs of nations. And some people say, well, that's, he's in control of nature and these things that don't have a will of their own, but he's not really in control of people that way, really. The Bible says this, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of waters, he turns it whatever way he wants. He's even in control, in control of people. Even the most stubborn monarch, God can turn that heart as easily as a farmer can divert the irrigation canals on his farm. He can turn the heart to whatever way he, wa he wants. And by the way, that's comforting to know because sometimes it might seem like our life is in the hands of someone else. The decisions they make, a government official can deny a visa. A professor can determine the academic success of a student. A supervisor can block or promote a career. It might seem at times that we're at the mercy of other men, but that's not true, dear friend, because God is the one who controls hearts to accomplish his will. One of my favorite stories about this is George Washington. When he was 17 years old, he wanted to join the British Royal Navy. And his mother consented. She said, okay. And he, he packed up all his things, and he went down to the dock, and he was going to put his things on a frigate and go on a boat and join the Royal Navy. And had he done that, he would have been fighting for the British instead of the Americans. But there came a, a messenger from his mother and said she changed her mind at the last minute. She refused to sign the consent form because he wasn't 18 yet, so he didn't go join the British Royal Navy. You think that was an accident? God controls the hearts. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Well, that ends another service here at Grace Bible Baptist Church. For those of you who are listening for the very, very first time, we want you to know that this program is bought with a caring heart. We care about you. We want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We want you to know the Word of God, how that you can live and walk with Him and have an inner beauty and an inner rest that only God can give to you. Well, you must come and visit us at our church, 1518 North Rolling Road, right here in Catonsville, Maryland. You still have time to make the service. Now, you'll find a number at the end of the screen. Give us a call. We're there to help you. God bless you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you every Sunday.